Before I introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, I'd like to do something we typically do at the very end of the conference. But when we do it then, everybody's getting ready to get on planes and trains. We're going on Liberty in Annapolis. And I always feel that the people get not the credit that they should in the spotlight that they should. So I'm going to take the opportunity to thank a couple of key people who have made this work and have been planning and working on this conference since uh, the fall of 2011. Uh, the first individual is the person who set the agenda, secured the speakers, the panelists, helped lead the Stockdale Fellows during the, during the year, and uh, ha has done just a superb job. And that's Dr. Ed Barrett, who's standing right there. The second individual could have starred in the movie The Wedding Planner, if you ever saw that. Uh, some of you know, some of you don't. I have 10 children, three of them are married, so I keep pretty close tabs on this lady, knowing that I'm gonna need her help a number of times coming up here. By the way, if you are concerned about that, they're all mine, they're all with the same wife, and yes, we know how it happens, so in case you're... Um, but this, this lady uh, organized the logistics for this conference, the meal planning, the administration with it, the reception that you enjoyed last night, and a hundred other tasks, most of which we don't even know about, but she did it. And that's the center senior um, associate, uh, st senior staff associate, Ms. Marge Bem, who's behind the computer over there. And she was ably assisted by Jacqueline Dan, who's probably out there still welcoming people coming in, but she was also a big part of enabling this to, uh, to occur. The next individual ran the registration process and has actually been updating our Facebook in real time as the conference has been going on. So any of you who actually have younger participants in your family who understand Facebook and can follow that and do that, Sean Baker over there has been uh, helping with that process. There were three individuals who, again, throughout the planning, the uh, preparation and the execution phases provided crucial leadership. Uh, the distinguished chair of ethics, uh, Dr. George Lucas, the distinguished chair of leadership, General Sattler, and the uh, deputy center director, Lieutenant Commander Scott Larson. So I'd like to thank all of them as well. George, General Sattler, Scott Larson in the back. And finally, I'd also like to thank our friends with the uh, Multimedia Support Center that do the sound and the camera filming, the alumni hall personnel that keeps the temperature exactly right, solves all the crises that we have as we go on, the crew from the staff and faculty club that has been feeding us, and the information technology services division that's represented by Kathy Kindig also at the desk there. I'd like to give them a round of applause as well. So if you see any of them, I would ask you to also give them a, a special thank you for what takes place, because an awful lot goes behind the scenes. Now I'd like to turn to our keynote speaker. Major General Dunlap is a retired Air Force officer with over 34 years of active service. His Air Force career included tours in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Korea, and he deployed for military operations in Africa and the Middle East. Prior to his retirement, General Dunlap assisted in the supervision of more than 2,500 military and civilian attorneys worldwide. Now, I've got to pause there and say I've always been impressed with General Sattler commanding a Marine Expeditionary Force and as much as that takes. But he's never had to command 2,500 attorneys. So I think this puts General Dunlap in a separate extraordinary category of being able to... <laughs> The general is, a, is currently the executive director of the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security at the Duke Law School, where he also serves as a visiting professor of practice. He's a prolific writer and addresses a wide range of topics, including various aspects of national security law, air power, counterinsurgency, cyber power, civil-military relations, and leadership. 
in all areas. No one is accepted. His most recent cyber-related publication, Perspectives for Cyber Strategists on Law for Cyber Warfare, appears in Strategic Studies Quarterly. He's a two-time McCain conference keynote speaker. This is mainly because Ed wants to keep bringing back significant Air Force flag officers to balance any Navy flag officers that are here. But he's actually back because it was such an outstanding presentation two years ago. We're grateful to have you back, sir. Please join me in welcoming General Dunlap. That was really and truly an, an undeserved a uh, very nice uh, introduction. And I sort of am a legend in my own mind, so uh, <laughs> goes without saying. I really enjoy coming to this conference, and believe me, it is an honor to be invited back. And I want to congratulate everybody at the Stockdale Center and Ed and so forth for putting this conference on. Because uh, I've always been impressed by the enthusiasm and energy that people who come to this conference bring, bring to the discussion. Because, and I think we saw some, I only got here, I missed the morning, but I got here yesterday afternoon. And I, I'm always impressed with the intensity and the knowledge and the, the quality of the discussion that you get at this conference, because you don't, you don't get it other places. Now that I'm in academia, I, I go to go to some conferences that, shall we say, are not exactly on the level of this one, but um, this is really, really terrific. And what's interesting about it, especially in the cyber realm, there are conferences on the technology. There are conferences on the law. In fact, the Naval War College is going to have a really good one at the, at the end of June on the law. And there, there's some on ethics. And I went to one, it was more on bombing, use of technology, and so forth on ethics. And what was amazing to me is that nobody in the room actually knew how the systems work, but they were pretty sure they knew what the ethical dimensions were, and I'm not sure how you do that. The genius of this conference is that, that it's in, interdisciplinary, and it brings together all the players, and guess what? Nobody is afraid to talk about the hardest piece, and that's the ethical piece. And that sometimes gets lost in these discussions, and that's what the value of the McCain conferences and, in fact, the Stockdale Center. I congratulate um, the Navy and the Academy for supporting it. You know, one of the things that we sort of touched upon this already about cyber is the, is the problem of language. Uh, and I think Admiral Rogers sort of talked about this, and one of his goals is to try to normalize the, the language across the board. And in my career, um, and I was honored to serve for 34 years, and by the way, I make my students express surprise when they hear that 34 years, that somebody as young looking as me, <laughs> they've gotten to the point where they say, uh, yeah, we know, professor, you don't look it, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but, but language can be a problem. And one of the things that happened to me in my career, it was really highlighted that challenge because uh, one of the great things about military service is that you do get to travel, and I went to South Africa, which is one of the most interesting countries I went to in my whole career. And trying to be a good guest, as I was yesterday, trying to sample all the local wines, uh, I picked up a bottle of wine. They took me out to dinner. The South African Jags took me out to, out to dinner. I picked up a bottle of wine, and here the whole lab the label was entirely in Afrikaans, which is one of the 22 official languages of South Africa. I could see all the South Africans looking at me, and I poured a little glass, and I took a sip, and to be perfectly honest with you, it was terrible. And this was kind of an integrity matter now, so I kind of looked at it, and I smiled, and I said, well, very interesting, which it was, in a terribly horrible way, it was interesting. <laughs> so anyway, I'm drinking this stuff, and um, Finally, about 10 or 15 minutes later, one of the wives of the South African officers, she leans over to me and she says, Colonel, you do know you're drinking the salad dressing, don't you? <laughs> I said, I thought it tasted like vinegar, bro. <laughs> anyway, like I say, I fulfilled my ethical responsibility by saying it was interesting. But, like I say, the, the genius of this conference is the unabashed 
willingness to look at the ethical dimensions, and I'm going to try to touch on a few issues this morning. Uh, and of course, much of this discussion does involve the law. And as the historian Jeffrey Best has written, he said, it must never be forgotten that the law of war, whatever it began at at all, began mainly as a matter of religion and ethics. It began in ethics, and he says, and has kept one foot in ethics ever since. And certainly, adherence to the, to the law is a baseline responsibility. But it's only the baseline. There is a great article by a Navy lieutenant uh, in the March 2012 issue of Armed Forces Journal, where he goes after this specific issue, where he talks about law being the baseline. But he also argues that, rather persuasively, that in inculcating individual and institutional moral and ethical values, a sense of honor is, is what he, the term he uses, is what is essential to actually achieving adherence to the rule of law. And I thought that that was, there's some real genius there. Um, and as the discussions at this conference, however, reveal, uh, even determining that baseline, you know, what is the law isn't always easy in cyber operations. As others have pointed out, most of the law of war was formulated with kinetic weaponry in mind. And nevertheless, in my view, anyway, um, I think that existing law is readily applicable, at least the key portions of it, to cyber operations. And this perhaps brings us to the first issue about the intersection of law and ethics. And that's the notion that we sometimes hear is that cyberspace is so new that no law applies or even should apply to cyber operations. And that's simply untrue. Um, most of the law of armed conflict is not domain specific. And in, along this line, I'd ask you to consider a, uh, a project that was done by uh, Harvard, the Harvard program on um, humanitarian law. And the, I was involved with it as were a number of other people, maybe even some in this room. And it was an effort to write a manual focused on air and missile warfare. And it was about a several, six or seven year effort. And it did produce a useful volume. But let me tell you something, it's a slim volume. Because what was found is that there's relatively little law that can be said to be very unique to air and missile operations. And I think we ought to keep that in mind as we, as we look at, at cyber operations. What really and truly is unique that would require something new? And I'll, I'll give you my views on on future cyber treaties. And I think what's really important is sometimes what masquerades as a legal problem is really a question of technology or a policy conundrum. For example, the, the much ballyhooed issue of active war, is that really a legal issue? And we, we heard somebody, uh, I think Martin Lubicki, talked about it being a political issue, which it is. But nevertheless, when you start, it can be analyzed under the law of war and under international law. The problem comes up is that it requires technology to produce adequate data to determine the harm caused and the sufficient information so as to determine exactly who caused the harm. And so the need for attribution can be a legal showstopper. Um, when people want to do something when some cyber event occurs. But it's hardly unreasonable, I would suggest, for the law to require reliable information as who might be responsible before launching some kind of counterattack. The fact that technolo technologically speaking, determining attribution is a daunting task is not a problem for the lawyers or the ethicists, per se. It's something for technologists to solve. And much can be, the same can be said about the, the issue of cyber targeting. The principles of distinction and proportionality require technical data that will inform decision makers as to who might be affected by particular techniques and to what extent. Again, this is a technically hard to do sort of thing. And General Statler talked about how the technology that's been developed to do it in the kinetic realm. Uh, but in any event, that's a scientific issue. And I've often said that the number one most needed technology to enable cyber operations is a capability to model cyber 
if you can model it, then you can inform decision makers of the law, how, how the law would apply to a particular operation. And it would also provide invaluable information for us to determine the, the scope and se severity of a particular cyber methodology that might be used against us to determine whether or not a use of force actually occurred. And just as a segue, and we can get it at it in the Q&A if you want, I am shocked to hear my good friend uh, Gary Sharp give his view that, or state, that the official U.S. government policy is that under uh, UN Security Council, or under the UN Charter, uh, the definition of force under 2 sub 4, that there's no gap between that and what armed attack means in Article 51. Uh, I don't think that's the law. I don't think it's the correct reading of the law. But also, I can't, I can't foresee how that could possibly be in the United States' interest to have that kind of definition or to promote that kind of norm. Again, we can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. But equally or more problematic from both a legal and ethical perspective is the view that efforts to apply the law will so encumber the United States' uh, cyber efforts that the nation's security is put at risk. This is the argument espoused by my friend Stuart Baker in a September 2011 article on foreign policy. According to uh, Mr. Baker, lawyers, quote, have raised so many show-stopping legal questions about cyber war that they've left the military unable to fight or even plan for war in cyberspace, unquote. He claims that any attempt to impose, to quote, impose limits on cyber war are doomed. More, most troubling, in my view anyway, he points to the devastation caused by World War II air warfare and references former British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin's 1930 claim that, quote, the only offense only defense is an offense, which means you've got to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourselves, unquote. Mr. Baker then goes on to cite the concept that Mr. Baldwin uh, uses uh, by asserting that, and this is Mr. Baker speaking, if we want to defend against the horrors of cyber war, we must first then face them with the candor of Stanley Baldwin, and only after constructing a, such a cyber war strategy, uh, he, Mr. Baker then says, then he would ask the lawyers for their, quote, thoughts. Um, segue here. As a practical matter, those of you who have been involved in military operations, when I first was involved with them many, many years ago, the lawyers would only be brought in at the very end. And in, in air parlance, this is when the major attack, the map briefing, major attack, major air attack plan briefing or whatever, you know what I mean, General Stone. And then, and you know what happens there. If there's a legal objection raised, they can't redo the plan. They have to drop that sortie and you lose that much of the combat power. So the process has been changed so that the lawyers are brought in during the planning process so that when the plan is presented to commanders, that particular kind of issue isn't presented. But be that as it may, uh, I have a lot of objections to what my friend Mr. Baker says. And uh, what I find very interesting when he says that we don't, lawyers are stopping from even planning for cyber war, this doesn't match up with the public statements that we're getting from senior military leaders. For example, in, even about the very sensitive matter of offensive cyber war. Consider this. In November of 2011, Reuters reported that uh, Air Force General Robert Keller, who, as you know, is the U.S. Uh, Strategic Command commander, the parent command, I think, of Cyber Command, and uh, he acknowledged that, quote, the U.S. military now has a legal framework to cover offensive operations in cyberspace, unquote. And General Keller then added, that he did not believe that we need new explicit authorities to conduct offensive operations of any kind, and added that he did not think that there were any issue about authority to conduct operations. 
But I think most pernicious about Mr. Baker's suggestion that somehow in the 21st century conflicts, uh, in 21st century conflicts, the law doesn't really matter, and to the extent it does, it's an impediment to our security, especially in the cyber realm. I think that's a very troubling theme. Allow me to offer this general observation. People with concrete experience in actual conflicts know well what happens these days to those who think that law doesn't matter. They end up not just as battlefield losers, but also with a hangman's noose around their neck, which Saddam, or bullets in their forehead like bin Laden, or cowering in a sewer pipe like Gaddafi. Is it really true that the only way to deter cyber attacks is to threaten innocent people with some kind of cyber damnation? I don't think so. Ethical considerations aside, the 21st century is replete with examples that prove that too many of our most dangerous adversaries are rather indifferent to the fate of civilians, uh, including their own people. So trying to deter them by threatening innocent civilians, I, I don't think will really work. Because consider this. Does anyone think that those who are disposed to set off bombs in markets filled with children are going to be deterred in any way by some threat to cybernetically turn off, um, I don't know, incubators or something in a hospital? You know, the fact of the matter is they don't care about dead babies all that much. You know, it's not going to deter them. What military experience shows, however, is that what might actually work is to hold at risk the perpetrators themselves and often the means by which they execute their attacks. That Mr. Baker rejects this proven and fully lawful and ethical military approach is, is really genuinely puzzling to me. My argument is this. Whatever one might think of lawyers, from a military perspective, adherence to the law itself is not just intrinsic to an honorable and decent people. It's also a practical, hard-nosed necessity for success in contemporary military operations. Well, why is it? Actually, the answer is kind of uncomplicated, I think. Virtually no one, in uniform anyway, who has experienced the vicissitudes of war since 9-11 would underestimate the, the deleterious impact of the mere perception of American law lawlessness can have. Abu Ghraib is just the most glaring example. It's become it, uh, the greatest reversal that America has suffered since 9-11 and continues to hobble our counterterrorism <clears throat> efforts. Uh, General Petraeus observed that, you know, he said, Abu Ghraib and other situations are non-biodegradable. They don't go away. The enemy, Petraeus says, continues to beat uh, to beat you with them like a stick. In short, military commanders want to adhere to the law, not because they've fallen in love with lawyers or anything like that, and I can assure you that's, that's not the case, but because they have hard experience with the consequences of failing to do so. And tragically, there are more recent examples of illegalities from Afghanistan that similarly carry the potential to unravel our efforts there. So it's mind-boggling to me to suggest that some kind of no-law cyber policy would be anything but catastrophic to U.S. interests. Furthermore, I would argue that an effective response to cyber threats is not an autarkic enterprise. It requires the cooperation of international allies. And Mr. Baker's damn the law and lawyers approach, my interpretation of it, would cripple our relations with the law-abiding nations whose cooperation we must have in order to address cyber threats. Because we have to keep in mind that the majority of adverse cyber incidents are criminal matters, and the resolution of them frequently necessitate the involvement of foreign police and judicial authorities, who by definition uh, require partners who are themselves are committed to the faithfulness to the rule of law. Another problem with the theory <coughs> arises uh, from Mr. Baker's apparent misreading of the ethic of those in uniform who would be called upon to execute the kind of Stanley Baldwin style cyber attack against non-combatants that he seems to be suggesting. Members of the armed forces take their oath to support and defend the Constitution very seriously. They do not list to conduct plainly unlawful operations against helpless civilians. <clears throat> 
Consequently, I think it's absurd to think that a Stanley Baldwin style stratagem would be knowingly embraced by those in the armed forces or their civilian counterparts working with them. Wearing the uniform doesn't transform Americans into some kind of automatons <clears throat> indifferent to the rule of law, as some evidently believe is the case. What's, what's more is that I think it's obvious that the American people would back their military's ethics and not this Stanley Baldwin philosophy. And I think it's important for us to understand that the American people have more trust in the armed forces than they do any other institution in American society, include things like organized religion and, and the Supreme Court. We can argue maybe or discuss that is that really a good thing. But the other part of it is there's also polls that show that second only to nurses, the honesty and ethics of American military officers are rated highest among the, all the professions in the United States. Uh, but what Professors Michael Reisman and Chris Santo wrote in their 1994 book, and I quote this often because I think it is so true. They said, in modern popular democracies, even a limited armed conflict requires a substantial base of popular uh, public support. That support can erode or re even reverse itself, no matter how worthy the political objective, if people believe that the war is being conducted in an unfair, inhumane, or iniquitous way. And so I think, um, I think a further uh, rationale that unravels this theory that that we're, we're so cyber vulnerable that we have to have this, this Stanley Baldwin style uh, deterrence theory is the fact that uh, those who are deterrable, typically na nation states, are just as deterred by something I think, Jeff, you mentioned yesterday. They're just as de deterred by the other aspects of US military power as they are by any ambiguity that we may have as to our cyber capabilities. And in any event, more precisely, what adversary would assume that the U.S. is deficient in its cyber weaponry? What adversaries do know is that the U.S. military is the most powerful in the world, even though it works to comply with the law. So. I don't see any empirical evidence to suggest that an adversary would think, well, because they follow the law, they're weaker, ergo, we are going to attack them cyberly. I don't, and why, why they would think that, given our military prowess in the kinetic world, even though we follow the law. I would argue that uh, for adherence to the existing law of war, but I'm not among those who want additional international law to address cyber war. Unintended consequences can flow from a lot of well-intended efforts to limit the horror of war through international agreements. I think this is especially so when agreements focus on specific systems and capabilities as opposed to effects. In particular, with respect to proposals concerning cyber operations, I believe great caution is indicated. For example, the Russians have long proposed an international cyber agreement. They call it an information warfare agreement. Uh, however, uh, Tom Jelton wrote a pretty, as many of you know, he's a, he's a journalist. He wrote a pretty interesting article about this, and he, he warned that democracies have reasons to proceed cautiously in this area precisely because of the differences in the way cyber attacks are defined and the international norms. He points out that the Russians and others see ideological aggression as a key cyber war evil and appear to be seeking an agreement <clears throat> to assist government censorship of the internet and to ban outside countries from supporting cyber efforts of dissidents. And Jelton advises that in a 2009 meeting, and I'm not sure if this might have been one that, that somebody here was at, uh, to discuss re Russian proposals, the U.S. delegation declared that existing international law could theoretically be applied to cyber operations and the United States would continue to support the establishment of norms of behavior that like-minded states could agree to follow in cyber state. I would suggest that caution is, even for that modest proposal, is indicated. Because as, as attractive as it may be to have an international consensus as to what constitutes an act of war, uh, 
Once an international war norm is established, it be, could, could become a legal impediment that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Now, I will say that there are some kinds of, of agreements that we ought, to, we ought to look for and that can be helpful. Um, we just yesterday there, I thought I made a note about it, just yesterday there was a, a report that the Russians have agreed to use the hotline that we've set up for nuclear uh, incidents to use for cyber incidents. I'm, I'm all in, in favor of that kind of thing. Um, in any event, uh, I think existing international law gives us plenty to think about. And let me talk about what I think one of the most serious concerns is. And Admiral Rogers alluded to this yesterday. We cannot conduct cyber operations without the involvement of civilians. It's, there's, a, there's a technological nut there that can't be cracked or can't be very easily cracked by, uh, by people in uniform alone. We need the help of uh, civilians. Now, that said, the extent of the access we have to have the ex expertise and precisely what that access does or should do is properly the subject of legal and ethical scrutiny. And the basics aren't hard. In order to enjoy the combatant privilege, that is the license, so to speak, to engage in destructive acts against an enemy's person or property uh, during wartime without fear of prosecution, one normally has to be a member of the duly constituted armed forces of a belligerent. This has often been misunderstood, I would argue, to mean that civilians, even when they act on behalf of their government, cannot directly participate in hostilities. In my view, they can. Uh, and they can, they can do so without necessarily violating international law. But there are consequences, and chief among these consequences is the fact that if they fall into the hands of the enemy, they might be properly subject to the enemy's domestic criminal law for acts which, if done by a lawful member of an opposing military, would be privileged from prosecution. Now, what is more is that under the law of war, civilians are properly targetable, kinetically or cyberly, when they directly participate in hostilities. Well, what does this mean in the cyber realm? Well, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and for those of you who want to double check me, if you Google direct participation in hostilities and frequently asked questions and answers in 2009, you'll, you'll get where I'm getting this from. They used as examples of direct participation as, quote, interfering electronically with military computer networks and computer network attacks as well as some other things. What does all this mean from an ethical perspective? For one thing, it's essential that we make sure civilians understand the potential consequences, especially when the civilian is away from his or her work site. And let me explain what I mean by that. There is a debate in the international community about what it takes for a civilian to be targetable on the same basis as a member of the armed forces. I think that the ICRC would agree that even the ICRC would agree that those civilians who assume a continuous combat function as opposed to mer merely participating in hostilities in a spontaneous, sporadic, or unorganized way can be targeted on a similar basis to military personnel. Now, here's the thing. Regular military personnel, uh, and I would contend civilians regularly engaged in a continuous combat function such as computer network attack, can be attacked with any lawful weapon wherever and whenever found, regardless of whether at that particular moment the individual presents an imminent threat or is otherwise doing a military function. This could mean, for example, that a civilian cyber warrior regularly engaged in computer network attacks operations might be legitimately struck by a lawful belligerent in his or her home in a Washington suburb. And not just with cyber weapons either. Any lawful weapon can be used if it's employed in a way that complies with the law of armed conflict. Accordingly, if the civilian is sufficiently critical to US cyber operations, he or she could be attacked with great violence 
wherever found, provided that the incidental death or injury to innocent civilians, like the cyber warrior's own family, that might occur in such an attack was not excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated, which in the case, this case would be the death of the cyber, uh, cyber warrior. Thus, I think that the ethical issues uh, may be the extent to which it is appropriate to ask civilians to take these kinds of risks. It's all well and good for members of the armed forces who voluntarily take up what we call the unlimited liability contract to put their lives at risk, but we need to ask ourselves to what extent is that appropriate to ask civilians to undertake. All this said, I don't know how real this threat might be. I do think, though, that in an era of sleeper cells and the proliferation of clandestine special operations capability among many countries, that this effort to counter America's cyber capabilities may not be as outlandish as it, as it might seem at first blush. In any event, this discussion of personal risk that cyber operations might occasion makes it kind of ironic to me that cyber warriors need to steel themselves through cruel assaults on their ethics and professionalism by some critics. Specifically, there is a penchant among some to assume that it's somehow unmanly or unworthy not to give one's adversary the opportunity to kill you in close combat. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, in other words, a cyber warrior who wages war from a computer console far from the traditional battlefield may find his or her professionalism ridiculed, if not accused of outright cowardice. In this respect, consider the experience of drone operators who do in fact wage war from computer consoles. A very recent article, very recent, by one pundit was entitled, With its deadly drones, the U.S. is fighting a coward's war. And that's just an example of the kind of rhetoric that's out there. How did all this start? Well, it might be traceable to remarks a few years ago by another friend of mine, uh, Dr. David Kilcullen, a retired Australian Army officer who became one of the most foremost advocates of the, of the uh, counter ground centric, I might add, manpower intensive form of counterinsurgency strategy that found expression in the Army and Marine Corps manual FM 3-24. Again, I should say that David's a friend of mine, but I really do differ with him here. In any, in any event, in 2009, he said, he testified before Congress, and he said that in the Pashtun tribal culture of honor and revenge, face-to-face -face combat is seen as brave. Shooting people uh, with missiles from 20,000 feet is not. And according to, uh, to David, quote, using robots from the air looks cowardly and weak. And you can see how this thesis might be applied to computer uh, cyber warriors. Uh, regardless, uh, what, what makes this, these statements so stunning in their irony is that it, the Taliban, who I would suggest a few of them are Pashtun, uh, use IEDs to attack. They're not you know, enthralled with going face to face with the United States Marine Corps, I would suggest. And they also sometimes use children to plant these. So to me, that makes them look a little cowardly and weak. But regardless, I would suggest that this whole, whole discussion is rather immaterial. You know, to, to quote uh, General Patton, the object of war is not to die for your country, it's to get the other guy to die for your country. So I think that that has some real applicability here. And frankly, Physical courage, however admirable, is not necessarily the key to victory in the 21st century. There's a great article, by the way, a little segue, in the current issue of the Journal of Military History about Native Americans and the extraordinary courage, physical courage, that they showed in their confrontations with the U.S. Army. Um, and they conclude, the author concludes that, uh, that their individualistic and stylistic form of courage in warfare was no match for modern technology and an adversary for whom the goal was um, ultimate victory. To my way of thinking, modern technology, ultimate victory, that's what we're about. And along this line, I might note that in his classic study of courage, heroism in war, British historian Max Hastings 
made this observation. He said, you know, physical bravery is found more often than the spiritual variety. Moral courage, he says, is rare in the, on the battlefield in, in his study of military heroism. And I would suggest that it's exactly that kind of courage that may well be precisely what cyber warriors are going to have to demonstrate. You know, the reality is, is that there is nothing unethical about waging war from afar, or frankly, nothing unusual about it. For example, and I've said this before, I'd like to point out David slew Goliath with a missile weapon uh, before the giant could bring his weapons to bear. It's always been about engaging the adversary before the adversary can bring his weapons to bear. You know, uh, uh, Alexander the Great, 16-foot pikes when everybody else was using 12-foot pikes. That means you got four foot of pike through you before your pike even reaches the Macedonians. And um, it seems to me that English bowmen did a pretty good job at Agincourt against the French nobility by waging war from afar. And more recently, do you remember the Battle of 73 Easting during the first Gulf War? Let me tell you something. I think that had a lot to do with the fact that the gun the main gun on the M1A1 tank outranged the, T the Iraqi T-72 main gun. And they were plinking off those Iraqi tanks from a distance. And I don't think anybody is going to call those, those troops cowards. Still, there's something about computerized warfare that draws special scorn, however wrongly and unfairly. For example, uh, Philip Austin, a Berkeley-educated NYU law professor, was hired by the United Nations to write a special rapporteur report on targeted killings, which included comments about drone operations. And one of the things he said in there, he says, uh, since, well, you can conduct these through computers, uh, there's a risk of developing a PlayStation mentality. You know, Frankly, I went ballistic when I saw that, but I'm very much calmed down there. <laughs> you know, the idea that somebody is going to speculate about the integrity and professionalism of people they don't know, and they don't know how those operations are, is really, and that finds its way into an official UN report, I think is really un unconscionable. But in any event, Peter Singer, who wrote Wired for War, he wrote an article where he looked at this exact thing, and he found that when he did his study, that the stress levels among the drone operators, for a lot of reasons, and we can talk about in the Q&A, is actually higher than it was for many combat units in Afghanistan. And just last week, the Air Force Times, in an article, quoted an Air Force official where he went directly at this, and they explained all the stressors that are involved in this kind of warfare, because uh, it, essentially what they say is, you have time to think about what you're doing. And a lot of times in combat, you know, it's muscle memory and training and you're, you're reacting to trying to save your life. Whereas this, it's a very deliberate kind of killing of another human being and that causes enormous stress. But, so I, I think it's a, it's a faux argument, but it's out there and you need to be prepared for it. And you, it's gonna challenge your professionalism, but you need to know how important it is the people involved in this kind, these kinds of operations. And more recently, another aspect of the drone operations that I think has parallel was raised by um, Michael Hastings in the current issue of Rolling Stone. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Remember who Michael Hastings is? Remember General McChrystal? He was the reporter who wrote the Rolling Stone article about General McChrystal. But in any event, in his article in the current issue of Rolling Stone, he talks about how these uh, remote controlled nature, remote control operations, he's talking about drones, but I think it could be applicable to cyber operations. He said, the Pentagon can now launch military strikes or assassinations without putting a single boot on the ground and without worrying about public bash backlash over US soldiers coming home in body bags. The immediacy and secrecy of drones makes it easier than ever for leaders to unleash America's military might and harder than ever to evaluate the consequences of such clandestines, clandestine attacks. Well, for all this bluster, I think we might agree that, that Mr. Hastings has an issue that's worthy of discussion. Frankly, in my personal experience, I just haven't seen, even in situations, apart from cyber, 
where our use of force would be so dominant that there really would be very little risk to U.S. forces. I haven't seen senior military leaders, or that for matter, civilian leaders, who don't understand that once you start doing something, you can go down a road with very unpredictable consequences. I have not seen this cavalier attitude of using force, uh, you know, with, without keen consideration that the consequences can take you places that you don't want to be. But in any event, from a moral perspective, you have to look at the flip side. And in an article that just came out this morning by Ken Anderson and uh, Michael Waxman about ethics and law and robotics in uh, automated warfare, I think something about robotics, they talk about the flip side of this. Yeah. Uh, it does make it easier to use force, which means that you have a more opportunity to do the right thing. In, in other words, you don't have to sit by when a Rwanda is occurring and so forth. So there, there's two sides to the ethical challenge. But let me, let me say this. Uh, having said all that, it's not impossible that in a given situation, Someone involved in the process may have to step out of his or her lane or his or her comfort zone, so to speak, and ask the hard questions or point out some inconvenient facts. And I really want to underline this. It may call upon someone to act beyond the norm just to make sure all the right considerations are taken into account and the best decisions are made. And let me tell you something. This may not make you popular. And guess what? You may never be vindicated. But this is the responsibility of professionals. For lawyers, anyway, the ABA code provides an exact the code of professional responsibility specifically allows for holistic advice. What it says in Rule 2.1 is that lawyers are re required to give candid advice. And also, in exercising their independent professional judgment, they can refer not just to the law, but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's position. So those of you who are operators out there, if your lawyer seems to be getting out of his or her lane, please understand this is the ethical and professional responsibility rule that under, underpins that approach. And the rule mentions candor. And I got to say, and, and that suggested another thought to me that I'm sure that Mr. Clark, I missed his presentation, but I, I unless he's totally changed his view on things, I, he may have alluded to this. So this is really not so much a lack of candor, but rather a difference of opinion. And that ha has to do with the fact that there's received wisdom in this country and in many places that we are extremely vulnerable to cyber attack and that it's very easy for adversaries to do this and that we're about, there's all this talk about we're on the verge of a cyber Pearl Harbor and everything else. Let's remember that not everybody agrees with this. Just this week in USA Today, it was reported that Admiral uh, Cox from um, Cyber Command, quote, played down the prospect that an enemy of the US could disable the nation's electric power grid or shut down the internet saying that those systems are designed to withstand severe cyber attacks, unquote. But that wasn't nearly as biting as an article in the February issue of Wired Magazine by researchers Jerry Brito and Tate Watkins. I don't know who these people are, but I'm just telling you what's in the article. What they say is that the evidence to sustain such dire warnings about cyber war is conspicuously absent. They say that in many respects, the rhetoric about cyber catastrophes resembles the threat infl inflation we saw in the run-up to the Iraq war. And consistent with their conclusions, by the way, many of you have probably read this 2011 uh, report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which had concerns about uh, cyber war, but what they concluded was that there are very few single cyber-related events that have the capacity to cause global shock. And personally, honestly, I'm a little bit perplexed about you hear all this about how vulnerable we are, how easy it is to do. Well, if that was really true, why are the lights on today? Are we to assume 
that there are people out there that don't want to hurt us in any way they can with a very public and very grievous attack? Do you think after bin Laden was shot that al-Qaeda wasn't looking around for something that they could do? And if it was easy to do and, and we were so vulnerable, don't you think that they would have turned off you know, power stations or blown something up cy cyberly? Well, it hasn't happened. It doesn't mean that we should ignore the risk. What I am merely su suggesting that when we talk about this, we have to keep our re rhetoric tempered. And, and Brito and Watkins raise another concern in this regard. You know, they say that cybersecurity is a big and booming industry. And that, quote, Washington teams with people who have a vested interest in conflating and inflating threats to our digital security, unquote. Although they stopped short of actually accusing anybody of hyping cyber war for personal gain, they do call for a stop in the apocalyptic rhetoric and insist that the alarmist scenarios, a dominating policy uh, discourse, may be good for the cybersecurity industrial complex, but they aren't doing real security any favors. Now, I think we can debate the scope of uh, the threat and so forth, but I think that when you look at the title of their article, you get the whole point of what they're saying. They say, cyber war is the new yellow cake. And if you remember the run-up to the Iraq war, you see the point they're trying to make. And finally, let me just say one of the, the key responsibilities of cyber warriors, and especially their lawyers, and I would suggest their ethicists, is that of competency. And competency requires legal knowledge, but I would suggest that it requires much, much more than that. Um, there's no doubt that there are many aspects of cyber operations that are extraordinarily technically complex. Thus, I think it's incumbent upon legal advisors and ethicists to know the client's business in a way that will, is much more than the law, you have to understand the technology. You have to at least have a working knowledge of it. Because, and for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't know how you apply the facts to the law if you don't understand what the facts are. Secondly, in my experience in kinetic operations, and General back me on this, when you ask your JAG something, if he or she starts, looks at you and doesn't understand what, you know, uh, a gator mind system is, okay, you go on to, to something else. You lose credibility immediately. And the problem with cyber, what makes it particularly challenging, is you are never going to be done learning about the client's business. It just new, new, new. It is drinking from the fire hose constantly but that's the professional job that you're asked to do. I always like, and you can't wait, and I think Admiral Rogers said something about this, you can't wait until the crisis is there to try to acquire the expertise or the knowledge. And I like, there's a quote that's, that's a reference to Winston Churchill, some people say he didn't really say it this way, but I, I really think it is it's something I always talk to our lawyer, young lawyers especially. Because, you know, you ever been on that plane going on a deployment where a guy is like pulling out, then he, <laughs> I remember one time I was going to deployment, guy finally pulls out his orders and starts reading in his orders all the equipment he was supposed to bring. And he, he got some surprises in there. What do you mean? Hey, did you see where, who said we were supposed to, and bring our gas mask. I think it was the commander of CENTCOM because I think his name is on, on here. And so, yeah, I, I don't, you know, don't ask me, uh, but Sergeant Major is going to be looking in our bags when we get out of this airplane if your gas mask isn't in there. I, I, I tighten my chin strap right then and there. But what Winston Churchill says, to every man there comes in his life, lifetime, that special moment when he figuratively is tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for the work that would be his finest hour. In closing, allow me to return for just a moment to the debate with my friend Stuart Baker. Perhaps 
the most important takeaway I hope you have from this is that the idea that legal and ethical conduct um, has a moral rationale, surely, but it's also a very practical and pragmatic imperative. And never get the idea, I, I hope no one gets the idea that if they play by the rules, you're at a disadvantage. History doesn't show that, by the way. And true, in a given tactical situation, it may work against you, but strategically, your best war-winning strategy is adherence to law and ethics. And I think the, since 9-11, we have seen that in, in spades. In short, legal and ethical behavior really is for winners. Thank you, and I, I hope we have a time for a, a few questions. Jeff, we'll just walk, work our way. Charlie, I thought I expected a terrific presentation. A quick antidote for you can use in future. I was at 7-3 Easting. We actually ordered the tanks to back up. We could hit them, and they couldn't hit us, OK? And the 60 millimeter on a Bradley was eating up the T-60. So we did have lots of technological advantages. I was really intrigued by your, your comment there about you know, the use of robotics or cyber may give us uh, policy opportunities in other areas. You mentioned Rwanda. And, you know, right now we're struggling with Syria. And there's an awful lot about talk of using cyber against Iran and, of course, accusations the United States already did that. And I'm wondering, from a legal and, and a policy perspective, how you would feel about the United States with its allies announcing perhaps a big cyber attack or cyber armed sanctions or whatever ver verbiage we might use uh, against Syria, focused on the military, focused on, focused on the leadership as opposed to the population as large, as, as some kind of a step between that and actual boots on the ground in the current environment? Well, the problem with Syria is that we don't have a legal basis right now because the UN Security Council resolution has been blocked by, by China and, and Russia. But assuming that isn't the case, I have another problem is I don't really know who these Syrian rebels are. You know, um, there's a revolution in Cuba, you know, 38 years ago where they got rid of one dictator and they replaced him with another. So I don't know, but all that aside, I am very much in favor, and I'll even go further. I am in favor of cyberly attacking uh, what is presumed to be civilian property. For example, I would be okay with attacking uh, Assad's personal bank account cyberly as, if, if it can be done, right. as opposed to, if, if we were to do operations, killing a bunch of Syrian conscripts. <laughs> You know, okay, they're, they're in the, the enemy force. But we know, we've seen these, they're 19, 20, 21-year-old kids here, men responsible for themselves, but they're just doing what they think their country is asking them to do, and half the time they don't even know what the whole issue is about. So I would rather, this is, I wrote an article years ago, it's called Rethinking Noncombatant Immunity, where one of the things I don't like about Protocol 1 is that you can't use reprisals against civilian property. I want a reprisal is when you do something illegal, what would otherwise be illegal, to stop the enemy from doing something illegal. And I'd rather go after <coughs> personal property of these uh, key dis influencers or whoever it may be than to grind up the enemy, you know, force. Uh, because if we can destroy somebody's DACA or, you know, we can mess around with the fire control system so that it floods or whatever, and that starts influencing all the rich people. And a lot of this is based on the RAND study of why Milosevic gave up and the crony, the impact, the economic impact on the cronies uh, influenced them. So I think that's something we want to think through. Now, People will have critiqued it rather severely on the critical, uh, on the importance of the slippery slope. How do you then start dividing between what, well, you know, these are hard questions, but guess what? Cyber war is very difficult. 
There's lots of things we do in the military that are very hard to do. Bombing Baghdad was hard to do, but we do it. We, do, we are in the business of doing hard things and making hard decisions, which brings up another point about cyber. And I talked about this in the article. You know, as much as I love our cyber technologists, they come from an engineering background, where one plus one equals two. In warfare, warfare is an art. You know, and we, we talk about computers and so forth. What computer would have ever predicted success of the Inchon landings? There's something that goes on only in the mind of a commander who can evaluate imperfect data in, in <laughs> uncertain circumstances, and it will never be with the precision, with mathematical precision. This is because war is, a, is the clash of wills, and it brings into this un, you can't reduce it to a logarithm, this human dimension. And so when we think through this stuff, we have to understand that, you know, sometimes we're going to have to tell a computer uh, technologist who likes precision, who gets precision from his art, but you're going to have to make a judgment based on uncertain information and guess what, you may be wrong and bad things might happen. Military commanders do this every day. We have to understand, in the kinetic world, we have to understand that that's part of the professionalism that's required in the cyber world. Notwithstanding the, the proliferation of computers and decision support systems and everything else. Hi, I'm uh, Don Howard from Notre Dame's Riley Center, Science, Technology, and Values. Uh, I, too, thought this was a great talk. I especially like the fact that you brought up the question of the involvement of civilians in cyber conflict. And I want to ask you as a lawyer for your thinking or our thinking these days about what I think is a somewhat close analogy, and that is the targeted assassination of Iranian nuclear physicists. Uh, I'm interested in this question for multiple reasons. One, at Notre Dame, we have a very strong nuclear physics group. We send a lot of our PhDs to work in the national labs. We have a vested interest in the status of the people we're sending to careers of that, uh, of that kind. I've also tried to get my colleagues in the American Physical Society to begin a conversation about this, and I'm very frustrated. I just can't get any traction for this, uh, this conversation. Uh, but anyway, it strikes me that it's an interesting analogous case that we could uh, think well, about. it is, uh, but here's the detail, critical de de detail that I don't know. I don't know exactly what that scientist was doing. But if that scientist, if the acts that that scientist were doing were, and this gets really, you have to really, gets complicated, because if you're talking about someone who's engaged in continuous combat operations, and we need to think of that differently when we talk about nuclear, because nuclear in the legal world, when you look at the nuclear weapons case that the International Court of Justice says, it goes on literally for 500 pages. Anybody ever tried to read that opinion? It's like 500 pages. They're bad, they can't possibly be legal. And then, oh, right at the end, in the last paragraph, it says, oh, uh, yeah, but we can't say it's illegal if the survival of the state is at stake. And what struck me about that is they didn't say if genocide was going to occur or we're gonna have another Holocaust by some crazed Nazi. It was the survival of the state, a political entity, it's, then it's okay to use a nuclear weapon. So nuclear weapons are a little bit in their own category. So the whole notion of anticipatory self-defense is has to be thought through very, very carefully. But you're raising an important point. There are circumstances where I think in, in highly technological warfare, that scientists who do not normally conceive themselves as warfighters will be part, will be conducting activities that could be construed as, con as combat operations, and in any event, when, they, when they're involved in that, they can be struck, and if they continuously engage in it, just in Dunlap's view of the world, and I, I'm sure there's, there's going to be, there's a lot of dispute about what I'm saying, but I'm saying if a civilian at the behest of the state is continuously involved in 
in combat operations, I think that that person is vulnerable to being struck just like a regular military member. So this is a little bit new way of thinking about the world. Do we, we have time for one more question? I'm, I'm, Well, first of all, thank you for a very wonderful lecture. That was excellent. And I just want to start, before I ask my question, with the confession that uh, I, I'm actually one of the people who wrote about the Game Boy mentality of the drone pilots uh, oh, and the, the moral are you buffer. From Boston? Sorry, I'm not from Boston. No, I'm from a, Austin. No, I'm not from oh, Boston. No, I'm no Sharky. Like no Sharky from the University of Sheffield. Uh, I had written about that. Um, in some of my earlier writings, uh, I then have talked to quite a few drone pilots and realised their professionalism, and I've stepped back from that now in my writings. I still hear a lot of rumours. I'm not sure. I'm a scientist, and I don't know about that. So, so let, let me let me you know leave it to that. I don't think they're going to be telling generals not very much. So, well, can I qualify with what I said? Okay. If you and I were having a discussion here, and that came up, I. I want you to ask that question yes. so that you can get my response yes. or get or hear, hear different views. What I don't like is a UN, official UN document. Yeah, that's true. I understand. That is, that's yes. a whole different ballgame. That's I, I'm much more concerned about you. As a judge yeah. writing yeah. an opinion and saying, yeah, oh, okay. yeah, maybe yeah. they're a PlayStation. No, you need some evidence. I'm more, I'm more concerned about your politicians having a Game Boy mentality, actually, in the CIA, but let, let, that's not what I came to ask you. Uh, no that's not what I came up to ask you. I want to ask you is what, you know, what do you think is the greatest ethical, moral challenge in cyber warfare? You know, for instance, the principle of distinction to me seems like the greatest challenge because there's no separation between the, the military and the civilians. But I'd like to know what, what you think because it's very useful. I think... Here's what I, and this is going to be, I don't think that that issue of dual use and the fact of civilians, that's a technical problem that we can be challenged, that we can solve, I think. And in any event, it's covered under the existing uh, proportionality analysis. If it's dual use, before you take that out, you need to decide, you need to know what the effect is going to be on civilians and balance that against what you think you're achieving. For example, in the second Gulf War, did you notice we didn't take out the uh, the uh, electrical? We took out some nodes, but we didn't. We could have leveled every electrical plant in Iraq. We could have done it like that. I'm not just talking about doing other sorts of things. So we could have. There would have been glass there, practically. but we didn't because for a lot of reasons. And we had we went after the nodes that were supplying. So I think we can do that in cyber. Dunlap's, you know what I'm most concerned about? It's something I, I thought about putting in my speech. The threat of cyber war is causing the armed forces of the United States in this country to become so involved with things that are really domestic law enforcement and that invade the privacy of American citizens because of the nature of what you have to do. And I would suggest that there aren't many models in, in democracies where the armed forces have become involved in domestic internal security that has been a good thing for democracy. And I think if you talk to people from the British Army who were involved in Northern Ireland operations, it is their, the least favorite thing they've ever done in uniform because of that. So that's where I think the ethical, uh, that's kind of the most troubling part because I. I think it's very hard to preserve an ethic, a law enforcement ethic, if you remember the armed forces, because that ethic, and just uh, the footnote is, when you're in, there, when you're in the, the police, you try to stop people from doing things to bring it before our judicial process. In the military, when somebody's threatened, you destroy that threat. So it's a fundamentally different way of looking at the world. And I don't think it's good for a democracy especially one that depends on an all-volunteer force and having that very high ratings by the public of confidence. When they start finding out if this would occur, that people are reading, that soldiers are reading their emails and stuff like this because they have to do that for cybersecurity, I don't think that's what we want to do. I want to have civilians doing that, in my judgment. Thank you. That's a great answer. Thank you. I'm sorry. I
<clears throat> Fantastic presentation. Glad to have you back a second time, sir. And um, I want to thank you not only for your, your participation here, but your many years of service to our nation. So thank you very much, sir.